A few Sundays ago, we started a study on the fundamentals of fellowship. <clears throat> First thing we did was point out that God has a law of inclusion and He has a law of exclusion. Now, the first Sunday, we spent our time in showing from the Bible how to form that law of inclusion. We emphasized that man is sinned and comes short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death, Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23. That man could not be in harmony with God, he could not be in fellowship with God, yet remain guilty, while he remained guilty, of sin. The transgression of God's law, 1 John 3, 4. So God authored a plan. And we call it the plan of salvation. The unfolding of the scheme of redemption takes place in the Bible down through all the thousands of years. And finally it culminates in the fullness of time when Christ came in the flesh to do what only He could do on our behalf so that we could be saved from our sins. Because He did what He did that only He could do, did not rule out the fact that He created us free moral agents, agents with powers of choice, intellectual and rational, so we could understand the message of the gospel. So He located the power to save us in the gospel, the good news of Christ. And it saves us as we receive with meekness the grafted word and that we obey that gospel, Romans 6, 17, and 18. Thus, it's a faith in Christ built by the gospel, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And it has to be a faith that is obedient. He's the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, Hebrews 5, 9. Now, once we pointed out that that was God's law of inclusion, the great plan of salvation, hearing the gospel, believing it, repenting of our sins, and confessing our faith in Him, and being baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, and thus the Lord adds us to His church. Then we are concerned about uh, God's law of exclusion. Remember, most of the New Testament is written to those who are Christians. They have been by God in their obedience of the gospel included into the fellowship of God. I don't guess any of us appreciate that fellowship, but it cost the life and death of Jesus to give us the fellowship we enjoy with God as Christians and the fellowship we enjoy with one another as each of us are in fellowship with God because we have been included in that fellowship because we've all believed and obeyed the same gospel and we walk according to the same rule of faith. There are those who've been around for a good while and they, to say one thing, have been far more tenacious than we have in trying to get their error across that really all you have to do is believe in Christ and uh, then everything's all right. So they make really one obligatory matter. If you believe in God, you have to believe in Christ as Savior. After that, anything we do is just a matter of preference. And so, again, as we pointed out, that they came up with the idea that gospel is that which we must be united on, and doctrine is that which is just the way you like it and I like it. But the sad part about that is, is that in reading your Bible, there is no distinction made like that between gospel and doctrine. Gospel is doctrine. Doctrine is the gospel. The faith is doctrine. The faith is the gospel. Preach the word is to preach the gospel. It's to preach the faith. It's to contend for the faith. And so on. So we recognize that right there that whole concept breaks down. And the whole idea is to have some sort of unity without people having to give up things that are not authorized by the New Testament. And so we're interested in seeing how we formulate by studying the Bible, the right division of the word, 2 Timothy 2.15, the law of exclusion. Who is excluded? Well, I think we noticed that atheists, those who say there is no God, certainly wouldn't be included, but they would be excluded. 
Same would be true of those who deny the deity of Christ. However they go about denying the deity of Christ, they would be excluded from fellowship. Those who said the Bible is not the plenary verbal inspiration, uh, inspired word of God, they too would be excluded from fellowship with God. And so you could come on down the line to any step in the plan of salvation or as the church is organized and the work of the church and the worship of the church. And the reason why is, again, because of this scripture that we have posted above my head and been there for a good while now. What's, <clears throat> whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Now, if we don't do that, we don't have God in the doing of it. Last week, I, in fact, the week before, as we spent much more time on this uh, law of exclusion, we noticed a number of passages because we wanted to notice them because we have to have a way of putting together this law that we call the law of exclusion. So we noticed a number of passages and I have but one that I want to continue with and then move on. And that's in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. And the passage reads as follows, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For the things which are done by them in secret, it is a shame even to speak of. Now we could spend a lot of time on just really what he meant on things done in secret is a shame to speak of because that might tell us how we don't want to be using some terminology to try to describe what certain people do or don't do that's immoral or immoral. Paul, by the Spirit, says it's a shame to even speak of these things. So there's a proper way to address certain matters, and Paul says there's some things you don't even address just by the fact you know what they are. You don't need to know any more than that. It's wicked. I want us to note what is pointed out by this verse, what is taught by this verse. Because the view that fellowship is not something which can be extended and withdrawn by faithful members of the church who are obeying the scriptures, that's how they're faithful, is simply foreign to the plain and simple teachings of the Bible. So we conclude from this passage, and let's break it down, that A, it is possible that some works are the works of darkness. B, Christians are have no fellowship with such works. And C, those who are involved in such work are subject to proper disciplinary procedure. And what does that mean? Well, it means that they are to be drawn from if they will not repent after proper efforts have been made to lead them to repentance. I want to say again, because I've seen this all through my preaching career, if you want to call it that, that I see a great deal of effort made, and not enough even there, to remind us that we must be, as the body of Christ, seeking to preach the word to everybody, seeking to find opportunities to convert people to Christ, and doing it all the time. And that is so important. I don't guess we can emphasize how important that is. You can't talk about it enough. But what good does it do to baptize somebody into Christ and then after a period of months or years, they depart from the faith? Either the whole thing or certain aspects of it or they get caught up in the trespass. And we don't get all that concerned about it. We don't try to go get them to repent. We don't try to show them the error of their way. Yet we're taught very plainly in Galatians that if anyone is overtaken in a trespass or a fault, ye which are spiritual, that's the faithful members of the church, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Well, that doesn't mean all your overtures, no matter how much Bible you know and how well you are able to teach it, uh, when used for a person or to a person, applied to a person who is overtaken in a trespass, that doesn't mean they're automatically going to be restored when it says you with your spiritual restore them. But it does mean you are to be aware of the fact they've been overtaken in a trespass and you ought to do what your responsibility laid upon you by the New Testament says you're to do to a brother and sister. And if they don't repent, that's why you do have a law of exclusion. 
Now, we're going to try to put together this law, uh, but I still want to give some thoughts preceding this precise statement because it's important that once people are obedient to the gospel, they remain faithful. Heaven's not going to be their home if they're faithful for a year, five years, ten years, twenty years, and then they fall away. They will not go to heaven. The idea is you're faithful all your life. Heaven will be your home whether your life extends 10 years after you become a Christian or 50 years. You are faithful throughout that time period or else you fall away and you need to be restored. Now think for a moment. Every society has the right to protect itself by righteous means from unrighteous efforts to harm or to destroy it. Every society, and that includes the Lord's church, because it is a society, a spiritual society, has not only the right, but it has the obligation to be helpfully concerned about the whole of this society, the spiritual body of Christ. And that means to be rightly concerned and the obligations laid upon the faithful to be concerned about the individuals who comprise it. While there wouldn't be a group if there weren't individuals making up the group. So this concern must involve, it must result in, number one, planning and carrying out activities which are calculated to result in the welfare of the society as a whole and the individual members who compose it. Number two, there must be exhorting, reproving, and rebuking those who act in such fashion as to be harmful to themselves and or to other individual members of that society. And of course, to the society as a whole or to those who might be benevolent objects of its mission. In other words, we're talking about the work of the church. We're talking about what it means to edify the church, to strengthen it, to help each member grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ, that they can remain faithful. Number three, excluding from its fellowship all who refuse, that is, they reject the efforts of that society which is the church, to restore them to faithful and useful citizenship in God's kingdom. You know, we're all bent out of shape over illegal aliens. We've been out of shape of about citizens, actual citizens of the United States, but yet they don't do what they're supposed to and they don't uphold the Constitution. We get all bent out of shape on that. Well, long after these United States are gone and every other nation is gone, the kingdom of Christ will stand. And right now is the time of probation. Will we as citizens of the kingdom of heaven remain true to our Lord, our King, the captain of our salvation, until we die, our time is no more. And if we can get that uh, beside ourselves about uh, undocumented people coming over in our country, or those in the country trying to practice subterfuge and undermine it, well, we ought to be that much more, far more concerned about the kingdom of heaven and what goes on in that. And we who are citizens, because we're legal, we went through the process. God's law of inclusion. And the Lord added us to His church. You can't get in any other way than to obey the plan of salvation so the Lord can add you to the church. You must be baptized into Christ as a repentant believer who confesses his faith in Christ. Galatians 3, 26 and 27. All spiritual blessings in heavenly places are in Christ, Ephesians 1 and 3. So to try to not live according to the authority of our king in this kingdom, it's his kingdom, for our benefit, of which we're citizens in particular, then if we're going to just let uh, the drawbridge down and break the walls down, then uh, we're no better off than, in fact, we're far worse off than those who would break down the barriers separating the alien from the true American citizen. 
There's a fourth point, and that is recognition of varying stages of development on the part of those who make up this spiritual society, the church. With treatment, for lack of a better way to put it, fitted to the individuals involved. That is, dealing with each individual on the basis of where they are in their growth and development as a Christian. And this comports with the legal functions of a society recognizing the difference between a child stealing a piece of candy and a hardened criminal committing armed robbery. Uh, we have to have that kind of wisdom when it comes to dealing with a babe in Christ over and against someone who's been in the church 20 years and is as hard-headed as the foundation on which the church building sets on. And what they decide to do, they're going to do no matter what the Bible says. Well, you don't deal with both of them in the same way. There's always a period of time for teaching, for instruction, for urging and exhorting. Then five, recognition that church discipline is primarily positive in its nature. I don't think most people think that it is. But it is positive in its nature when it's done like God wants it done. And in order to be approved by God, it must be, there's no getting around it, be motivated by love. Love for the offender with the sincere desire that he or she will repent and be saved from their sins. And love for the church as a whole, which can be hurt by the spread of the leaven of unrighteousness. And love for the people in the world outside the Lord's church who would be repelled by an ungodly church. We don't think about that sometimes. When people in the church are living on the level of the world, yet they're claiming to be Christians and faithful servants of God, and the people outside in the world who know what they are can't see any difference in the way they live and the way these so-called Christians live, then what does that do for the church? It certainly doesn't boost it and help it in their eyes. Now I would like to give an expanded statement of God's law of exclusion. It will be recalled that God's law of inclusion, which involves the extent of Christian fellowship, entails that Christian fellowship should be extended to every penitent believer who obeys the baptism of the Great Commission. Mark 16, 15, and 16, Acts 2, verse 38, Acts 22, 16, Romans 6, 3 through 5. I've already mentioned Galatians 3, 26 and 27. And who walks in the light of God's word as a faithful child of God. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. So we're now concerned for a statement concerning the limits, limits of Christian fellowship. Now, from the passage which we considered, we rightly conclude that Christian fellowship is not, let me emphasize the not, is not to be extended to a one who does not believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. John 8, 24, Jesus said to the Jews, except ye believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. B, one who is a member of a denomination. Fellowship is to be confined to the blood-bought body of Christ. And this, of course, has weakened and the walls have fallen down between the Lord's church, recorded on the pages of the New Testament, the identifying marks being found there, and in churches founded upon the commandments and doctrines of men that are not the church at all. I wish we would recognize, and I mean this as lovingly as I can mean it, but I want to be understood that a Baptist and a Methodist and a Presbyterian and a Roman Catholic, they're denominations. They don't claim to be anything else but a denomination. They think they're saved upon their belief in Christ and they choose the denomination built by men, they admit it, to be a part of. Well, do you ever read in your New Testament that the Lord's church is described in that way? Folks, they're lost. And I guess one of the most tremendous things sold to the Lord's church over the last 100 years, and especially the last 50 years, by the liberals who are all over the place in the church today, and by liberal I mean those who teach doctrines that loose us from what God and His Word binds on us, 
is that we ought to sort of consider those who believe in God the Father and Christ the Savior and the Bible is the Word of God. And after all, on Sunday, don't they worship God too? Don't they carry around a Bible? Don't, yeah, all that. And to convince us that they don't need saving. They're all right. The pious and immersed. Well, when we begin to embrace that view, we've sold New Testament Christianity out the window. The Lord's church uses, loses all of its distinction. It's just one among various other human organizations. What's the question? <laughs> <laughs> one who is a member of a denomination fellowships to be confined to the blood-bought body of Christ. That is, you don't extend fellowship to a member of the church. Oh, what just embarrasses us so bad. What I bring them to, and this has happened with me all my life as a preacher in certain places. I'm going to be bringing so-and-so who's a member of the Baptist church. They've agreed to come with me next Sunday to service. What are you going to preach on? I know immediately. They don't want me to say anything to make that person realize they're lost as they can be. You run them off. They're already off. They're already lost. And what does that tell you about brethren when they got that way? Now, the rank liberalism of the last 20-some-odd, 30 years was built on that attitude. As one lady told me years and years ago, over 50 years ago, and she was as old as I am now when she said it, she came up to me and, and said, why don't you just preach the gospel and leave other people alone? Now, that's not just a made-up preacher story. I heard other folks say that people did that, but that happened to me. Sweet little old lady. But there's why the church has gone off the deep end. All those days we talked about when everybody knew the Bible. You know, each member knew the Bible so well that they couldn't find one at a courthouse. They'd just bring a member of the church in, lay their hands on his head and say, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? Well, that's a bunch of malarkey. That's all it is. There may have been a time when people better understood the fundamentals of the faith and the church. But there's always been those people around that don't want the folks around us to think that we think they're lost. That's the reason we need to study the fundamentals of what the Bible teaches on fellowship, law of inclusion, law of exclusion. So, any unbaptized person and any member of the Lord's true church who after proper procedure and disciplinary action has been followed does not walk in the light, 1 John 1, 7, but who walks disorderly, 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 through 15, and or is involved in the unfruitful works of darkness, Ephesians 5, 11, and or goes onward and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ. He says you have not God, 2 John 9-11. through 11. These are people that faithful members of the church cannot fellowship. Well, they can, but they must not if they too want to remain faithful. One of the things that's very good to do to remind ourselves what really went on when the church was restored in the early part of the 19th century is to realize that all of those people came out of denominations that they had decided through their own personal study of the Bible as the only rule of faith in practice. Those churches were not the church of which they read in their own scriptures. And they were persecuted right and left. And guess what? They couldn't leave one church of Christ because they got mad at them and run over to another church of Christ and get upset there after a few years and run over to another place. They weren't there. And nobody could run down to the preacher at the church of Christ and say, would you explain this to me? Because they weren't around. Believe it or not, they did what we advocate to everybody. They took their Bibles as the only rule of faith and practice and they studied them out of human institutions. And the people were so attuned to the Bible in the early part of the 19th century, they were honest enough to follow it. And that's exactly what restores the church in any country, anywhere, anytime, is when people will follow the seed of the kingdom of the Word of God and be honest-hearted as it's sown in their 
minds and they abide by it. People make a big to-do about what the church is. All the church is are people who hum humbly understood the Bible's teaching on what it is to become a Christian. And they obeyed the gospel and being baptized into Christ. They found others who had done the same thing, and they began to fellowship together under the authority of the New Testament and began to learn how to worship God correctly in spirit and in truth. They learned how the church was organized, fully organized with elders. The qualifications were there. And deacons, the qualifications were there. And so on. And there they learned it. Isn't that amazing? We tell people to do it all along, but so few people really do it. And we have a whole lot of people today who are simply saying, oh, the Bible's not a divine blueprint. The Bible is not a pattern. It just sets forth the love of God to people that can't save themselves, and all you can do is ask Christ to come into your heart. And then anything else, according to your talents and whatever, you can do, and God will receive it just if you think as you do it that this is offered to God. Guess what? That's not new. Cain tried it a long time ago. But it was Abel whose sacrifice was acceptable because he did it by faith. And that means it came by the word of God and he lived by it. God's law of exclusion stated precisely is this. In the light of all the foregoing that we've done over the last two or three weeks, it's clear that God's law of exclusion amounts to this. When the beliefs and or practices of an individual member of the Lord's church endanger his own soul and or unscripturally uh, endanger the souls of others, then he is subject to the proper disciplinary procedure of the church, and if he refuses to repent, then he must be excluded from the fellowship of the church. Proposition, I'll affirm that and put my name on it. Who wants to put the negative and sign it and say that's not true? Well, if it's not true, then it must be that we misused some of those scriptures that I used, or else we didn't use enough of them. We left some out so that we couldn't get the total picture before we formed the proposition. I put the word unscriptural in there because you can, false brethren can withdraw from faithful brethren because they're faithful. That is not anything unusual. It must be remembered that while God is interested in unity, we said this several times, He's not pleased with all that men call unity. God is pleased only with the unity which is truly based on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And further, it must be remembered that while God condemns some division, He does not condemn all division. For he himself commands some division coming out from among them, being separate. If that is not division, I'd like to know what it is. Christians are to live saintly lives. They are saints. They are set apart, definition of saint, suitable for the master's use. You're not suitable for the master's use if you're not set apart from the ways of the world. And that all begins as you comply with God's law of inclusion in obedience to God's plan of salvation. Now, I want to close with a statement from J.W. McGarvey of well over 100 years ago. And in his own personal life, he didn't follow through with some things himself. That he later, in his old age, admitted he didn't, he didn't see it like he should have seen it. But this is exactly what some people saw well over 100 years ago, into the 19th century. Usually in our modern experience, McGarvey writes, a great sin exposed in the church, such as that of Ananias and Sapphira, brings the church into disrepute for a time, diminishes the respect for it entertained in the community, and renders all efforts to add to its members futile. Why was the effect in Jerusalem the reverse of this. This is a serious question, McGarvey says, for those who bear the rule in the church. It is evident that the different dep difference depends on the very different way in which such scandalous conduct is now treated. If the Jerusalem church had tolerated Ananias and Sapphira by retaining them in their fellowship after their exposure, 
doubtless the, quote, ways of Zion would have mourned, unquote, and sinners would not have turned to the Lord. But the sudden punishment visited upon them by the Lord and the abhorrence of their deed manifested by burying them without ceremony in the clothing in which they died, and while their bodies were scarcely cold, made the whole community feel that here was a people among whom sin could not be tolerated. Have you ever thought about this? Who's going to preach their funeral? When's the viewing going to be? <laughs> All that kind of stuff. Well, when God took care of them directly from heaven, they dropped dead right there. And she didn't even know he was dead. And Peter said, the feet that carried your husband, now they're going to carry you out. What a loving bunch. We need to retrain our minds on what real love is. It was a safe place, he goes on to say, for a man who needed holy companionship to help him in the effort to live a holy life. A place in which he might expect every false step to be promptly corrected and through which he might confidently hope to make his pilgrimage to a better world. People who wish to make a compromise with sin and who join a church merely because they are afraid to live without some appearance of religion will always avoid such a church. But those who are in earnest about the desire to save their souls and do good seek just such a church as their spiritual home. When shall the rigid discipline which God established in the beginning be seen on earth once more? Let the shepherds of the flock give an answer as they remember that they must give account to God concerning the souls committed their care. That's from his new commentary on Acts, pages 80 and 81. Well, in my judgment, for whatever it's worth, this is an amazing and marvelous appeal. And we as children of God in this 21st century should give careful and prayerful attention to it. However, presently there is what has been a long-running effort to extend the right hand of Christian fellowship to almost anyone in sight, with little regard to what they believe or what they practice, they go ahead and advocate extending that fellowship to them. All I can say is, may God help us to reverse this trend and remain faithful to the plain and simple teaching of the Bible, which made us what we were long years ago and cause the church to be restored according to the divine pattern. And it'll be that pattern that will judge us all on the last great day. And it sets forth the fellowship into which we come when we're obedient to the gospel with God and with everybody else who obeyed the gospel. And how long that fellowship should continue. And to realize that fellowship could not exist if Christ had not died on the cross to make it possible. I don't know that sometimes when we're talking about fellowship, how much we enjoy one another as faithful Christians and all the things we do together in the work of the Lord, that we understand the fellowship we enjoy could not have existed if Christ had not suffered, bled, and died on that cross. And that's amazing when you see how lightly some members of the church treat that fellowship. If you're not a child of God, we beg of you to come into fellowship with Christ by obedience to the gospel we've studied. And as a child of God, if you've sinned, it may escape the eyes of some members of the church, and maybe some members of the church know it and won't do what they ought to do. Thus they sin too. But if you're honest with yourself and with God, regardless of what anybody else does or doesn't do, you know to repent of your sins and confess those sins and pray God for forgiveness. And once again, walk the straight and narrow way. And there's a reason it's called straight and narrow that leads to eternal life. It's the only way that does. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and while